Excited to be here. Uh, my name is Jude O'Connor. I am the Chief Revenue Officer of BidStack. Um, I've been in online digital media and digital advertising for over 20 years. Uh, 2023 will mark my ninth year now in gaming. Uh, it was really great to see some of the, the first look data uh, and research that the IAB presented earlier today, especially around myth number two about how easy or complicated it is to transact in game these days. Um, so, so I look at it as a, a nice tee up. It's almost like an alley-oop from Kobe to Shaq. I just got to throw it down now. Um, so we're going to dive in uh, and first introduce what BidSAC is, right? BidSAC is the leading in-game advertising technology platform. Uh, we help brands and agencies physically get into the game, into the immersive experiences that users embark on when they play their favorite games that they choose to play. Um, we natively take your 728 by 90s that already exist, no new creative necessary from your side. We natively take those 728 by 90s, we turn them into you know flags and banners uh, surrounding racetracks and racing games. We take those same 728 by 90s, we turn them into uh, you know field wrappers and leaderboards in uh, stadium and arena environments within sporting titles. Uh, we take your 300 by 250s uh, and turn them into Jumbotron ads, right, in that same world. Um, I like to think of it as so much more than like just a media buy, right? Like think about placing a 300 by 250 adjacent to content on uh, a publishing website. Like that to me is a, that's a media buy, right? When you uh, advertise in game, uh, you're doing so much more, right? You're making yourself part of the immersive experience that the user's having. Uh, and you really get to capitalize and take advantage of all the engagement and attention that gaming generates. Uh, those are two words you're probably gonna hear me circle back to numerous times in this presentation. Um, but what we're gonna do first is we're going to uh, take a walk through, as Zoe uh, alluded to, uh, two different timelines, right? So we're gonna take a quick walk through memory, uh, memory lane of uh, the advertising, digital advertising ecosystem and how it evolved. So for any fellow graybeards in the uh, crowd, uh, hopefully you have some fun reliving some of this. Uh, and then we're also gonna take a, a look at the evolution of video games and, and kind of end at a point where they're finally intersecting with one another in a very opportunistic time for brands. So, you know, let's just get started. So. The very first media buy on record took place in 1994. It was AT&T. Uh, they placed a $30,000 buy uh, on top of hotwired.com. It was, uh, it ran for three months for $30,000 at 100% share of voice. It just lived on top of the page, generated a 44% click-through rate because nobody had ever seen anything like this before. Uh, and it really just kind of kicked off the revolution uh, that we're all part of today. So from there, uh, in the next period on the timeline is the dot-com boom. Um, major tech companies emerged. Uh, online targeting became a thing. The IEB was founded. Thank you, IEB, for all you do. Um, uh, ad networks, you know, launched consolidating the industry's inventory into one easy to kind of activate place. Uh, and advertising at scale became available to the industry for the first time. Following the dot-com you know, boom was the dot-com bust, right? And I'm not gonna read, so if you guys wanna read, I, I encourage you to kind of read all the different things. I'm just gonna summarize the timelines. Uh, so many of these companies uh, became so over overvalued so fast. Um, they didn't have fleshed out revenue strategies. Uh, and, and quite frankly, a lot of the companies that took advantage of the boom went out of business during the bust. Next, we move into the period that I like to call the Renaissance, right? Uh, lots of the major players you still know today uh, came into existence during this time period. It was kind of like the remerge of the industry post the bust. Uh, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, they all came into existence during this time period. Uh, Google made a number of strategic acquisitions. Uh, they acquired a company called Applied Semantics, which later became AdSense. They acquired DoubleClick, they acquired YouTube, uh, and they really transformed themselves from what they were previously known as, right? as just the search company to the you know, overall media powerhouse that they are today. Uh, the next timeline, a part of the timeline is the programmatic revolution, right? This is when programmatic first really became a thing, right? The first DSPs were introduced into the industry. The first SSPs were introduced. Uh, the first ad exchanges, you know, came to be. Uh, and, and it really kind of laid the groundwork and the framework for the period uh, on the timeline I feel like we're still here in today. It's a longer period on the timeline, right? But it's a period of uh, innovation and standardization, right? So 
programmatic matured, a number of different you know, governing bodies put standardization in, in place for the transaction of programmatic ads, um, measurement became a thing, data privacy protection became a thing, and it kind of us ushered us into the period where we are right now, which is a period of time where like, in order for a brand to transact, they really need a couple you know, table stake things in place, right? They want data powered audience buying against massive scale, programmatically activated with measurement in brand safe environments. I really feel and hope that you guys agree that we're moving a bit more into an attention economy, right? So viewability is fantastic. It's how we've been measuring kind of the success and the effectiveness of upper funnel campaigns for close to a decade now. Um, the IEB, MRC just put out, you know, for their first ever standardizations and guidelines around the measurement of these intrinsic in-game ads, which is really exciting. Our partners over at the, you know, IAS, DV, Moat, they're working feverishly to build 3D solutions that work in real time and measure these ads for you third party. Um, but like, viewability and attention are obviously two different things, right? Um, even if you get an 80% viewability on your media buy, does anyone, you know, really think that 80% of the people that, you know, were served your ads actually paid attention to them, right? Probably not, right? So if we're moving towards attention, hopefully by the end of this presentation you agree, I do a pretty good job laying out the framework and the groundwork for why I feel gaming is the platform and the medium most poised to kind of take advantage and dominate in that new world of attention-based economy and attention-based metrics. We'll kind of put a pause on it there and we'll switch over to the second timeline I told you we were gonna you know, uh, review. Uh, it's the evolution of video games, right? So arcades were already in existence, but uh, you know, the first at-home video uh, game systems kind of really launched in the late 70s. Um, so that's what you're seeing on the far left over there with Atari boxing and Atari football. Uh, fantastic you know, technology for the time, uh, but it's obvious that innovation was necessary. Um, as we moved into the 80s, you see there with Mike Tyson's punch out, Tech Mobile, two of the most phenomenal games ever created, by the way. Um, like, it, it, right? It, it, uh, it, uh, it, there was innovation made, it's still cartoon-like, right? It, it's, it's much better than where it came from, but it's still not where we need it to be. Um, and that's all these publishers are really ever after, right? They want their games to be as real as possible. They want their virtual worlds matching the real world as much as possible. Every new iteration of their game, they at least release a new title. They're pushing the you know, limits of graphics, pushing the limits of gameplay, right? Um, so as we move into the 90s, uh, Boxing's Legends of the Ring, ABC Monday Night Football, I think there's some pretty solid you know, uh, advancements in realism. Uh, you also get your very first taste of in-game ads, right? So these titles were released in 1993, right? So this isn't brand new. Uh, it was just laborious to do it the way you used to have to do it, right? So Gatorade had to strike a deal with the publisher of ABC Monday Night Football in advance of the game being released. The ad obviously had to be hard-coded into the game. Once it's hard-coded in there and that game's up for sale, it's there now for life, right? It can't be edited, can't be changed, can't come down. Doesn't match that buying you know, uh, need that we just discussed, you know, brand buyers and programmatic buyers need today, right? Um, Boxing Legends of the Ring, same thing, right? You got Pepsi, Pizza Hut, like why does that, you know, uh, enhance the game? Because if you were to go to a professional boxing match or any sport that takes place in an arena or a stadium, you expect to see ads, you know, all around the rafters and things of that nature. So like that's actually helping them bring realism into their game. Uh, it provides more revenue to the publisher, it provides greater opportunity to the advertiser, everybody wins, but again, heavy lift, right? You can't, you can't execute this across 10, 15, 20 plus publishers at a time when everything's gotta be so custom and one-to-one. -one. This is what boxing and football games look like today. I mean, you may as well just be watching Monday Night Football, right? Uh, so imagine if you could, your ad up on that jumbotron or your ad on those LEDs within the stadium. You know, our tech can do that. This is the boxing title, Undisputed. It's the first boxing title in over 10 years that's allowed to use the likeness of real boxers. Muhammad Ali's in the game, uh, Rocky Marciano's in the game, the legends of today, like, you know, Deontay Wilder and Tyson Fury are in the game. 
our tech is mapped all throughout the game, right? If you go to a boxing match, you expect to see advertising on the canvas of the ring, in the rafters, in the padding on the, in the corner, right? Our tech can do that and bring it to you programmatically capable and, and capable of activation right here, right now at scale. So again, right, the, the, the IV's you know, uh, data you know, back this up, right? We, we talk about it, what do brands need? They need that data-powered audience against the scale with the measurement, programmatically activated, brand-safe environments, and, and audience attention, right? What does gaming offer? Gaming offers over three billion global gamers who are the most engaged people you're ever gonna meet. The average gamer plays upwards of three plus sessions per day. Um, average session times range anywhere from three to 10 plus minutes. Um, you, you're, when you advertise in games, you're capturing sometimes as much as 30, 45, 60 plus minutes of this user's undivided attention, right? Have you ever tried to talk to somebody while they're playing a video game? Right, good luck. It's like talking to a brick wall, right? You can't get a question answered. You, you can't hold a coherent conversation with them. Why, right? Because they're just so hyper-focused, fully immersed in this experience they're having with this game. And when you advertise in that environment, you're making yourself part of the experience, capitalizing, taking advantage of that undivided attention. You know how hard it is to get undivided attention from somebody these days, right? Uh, and what kind of results has it produced? I mean, we have uh, attentive metrics, you know, measured by independent third parties that are nine to 10 plus times what you can get from standard display ads. Um, brand recall, it says 40% up there. We just got a Lumen study back. If anyone's familiar with Lumen as an independent third party research company, prompted, uh, unprompted brand recall for one of the campaigns we just ran was 65%. Prompted brand recall was 84%. Those numbers are normally single digits, right? So, so that's the kind of power you get when you're advertising in these immersive worlds. And uh, again, like there's lots of talk about who's a gamer. Is a gamer brand safe? Is a gamer someone I want to reach? Uh, I can do a whole other presentation on that someday. Um, but you know, in, in a recent study, 79% of U.S. adults self-proclaimed themselves to either play games regularly or semi-regularly. So when you advertise in games, you're reaching not only you know, all the people in this audience right here who I like to think are high valuable audiences, um, you're reaching all those same people you're already reaching in all your other mediums and all the other advertising you're doing. The one thing you're preventing yourself from doing is reaching them in the one medium that they're choosing to spend their most time in and be most highly engaged in. So I really think we need to rethink that, right? So. Uh, I'm going to click this one more time, and it's going to show you a quick video that kind of highlights what we can do. Um, and while you watch it, I want you to really think about, um, you know, uh, again, placing that 300 by 250 adjacent to content on a publishing website. Uh, I don't want to be a jerk, but like, no one's ever going to remember that, right? When you advertise in the experiences, like I'm going to be able to show you right now, I'd like to say that nobody's ever going to forget it. So again, when you're ready to move into uh, attention as your core metric, I'd like to say that there's no other medium out there available to you at the scale you need with the buying capabilities that you need than what gaming offers today. So thank you very much for that. I'd like to call Nature on Maxwell up to the stage, I should say.
Natreon, please take a moment, introduce yourself and the team you run over at the trade desk. Yeah, absolutely. First of all, was that not cool or what? Did you guys see that? That was awesome. <laughs> cool. Uh, so guys, my name is Natreon Maxwell. I am the GM of all of the emerging channels at the trade desk, which is the largest DSP in the world. Uh, we focus on helping brands and agencies reach the best uh, audiences and impressions through data. So uh, as I just demonstrated, right, we're finally at a place where the technologies of you know, programmatic buying and video games have finally intersected and merged. Um, you know, please tell us how the Trade Desk is viewing gaming uh, both now and into the future. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, a large component of what I do at the Trade Desk is helping us identify future growth engines for the company. Right? It's hard to believe, but about five years ago, CTV was an emerging channel. right? Today, what we really look at is very similar uh, places where we could place our bets and hopefully those bets pan out and grow into standalone channels. In other words, if I do my job correctly, I really shouldn't have any more channels to oversee. <laughs> and, and the reason being is because they emerge into mature channels that ultimately stand alone as their own marketing channels in themselves. As we think about gaming today, we do see a lot of similarities between the space of gaming and CTV mm. years ago, right? And what, what those are is that there's a huge audience behind gaming, similarly to CTV. At one point, we assume that at some point, there's going to be more consumers viewing content over the internet than they would through linear television. As of June last year, that actually happened. There are more cord cutters than there are people who are subscribed to linear television, right? It was a good bet, right? We're making the same bet in gaming, right? As we see like some of the graphics that you showed us and how realistic a lot of these games are becoming, what we're noticing also is that the expectation of consumers is also growing significantly, right? Now, when you have like this expectation that's continually growing around the experience, the immersiveness, the graphics, it also increases cost of video games. Mm -hmm. And so as we're starting to see, a lot of the gaming industry is starting to talk about this next phase, which is cloud-based mm -hmm. or you know, over subscription-based. Subscription -based. Yeah. And what I think is that a lot of what's driving that is that at some point, we are also going to see advertising supported gaming come to the forefront of the industry. Yeah. What I really can't wait for is the time when it becomes normalized, right? Like yeah. like right now people still think that like seeing a brand activation in a game is like like oh that's crazy. Yeah. Like, no, very soon it's going to be just as normal as when you watch a YouTube video and you see a pre-roll, right? At one point in time that didn't exist, right? Yeah. Now it's an expected part of the experience, right? Soon you're going to fire up your favorite games and you're going to see brand activations in there yeah. and you're going to look back at the moment of time we're in now, right? Like 2 3 years from now and laugh that like we ever thought that was weird. Yeah, you know? 100% agree with you. <laughs> so, yeah, kind of a good lead into what we're saying here, right? So despite despite gaming being the fastest growing entertainment you know, channel in the world right now, I think it's probably been beaten to death over time that brand budgets are, are lagging yeah. behind the growth and the scale. Like, What do you attribute that to? Yeah, so overseeing the emerging channels at Trade Desk, I noticed this isn't just unique to gaming, mm. right? For example, like if you were to look at audio, for example, and you look at the time spent in media, you'll find that about 20% of the time spent in media is driven towards audio. But what you're also going to find is that only 5% of the budgets are driven towards audio. Mm -hmm. So there's an inverse connection mm -hmm. there, right? When you look at gaming today, though, what I think is interesting about it is that I don't think brands are just kind of sitting by the sideline because they're not bought in to the audience or the scale or the opportunity. I just think, and, and we've kind of talked about this today um, directly from the brands, is that I feel that brands are struggling to understand how they fit into gaming authentically, right? Pepsi was just up here. It makes perfect sense for Doritos and Mountain Dew. Like, that's super easy. Yeah, I expect to see that. But what about someone selling toilet paper? Like, <laughs> like where does that fit into gaming yeah, yeah. today, right? Everyone and uses it. Everyone uses yeah. it, right? And so I think that a lot of the brands that we see that are sort of sitting on the sideline and procrastinating around getting into gaming are there trying to find their organic, authentic fit within that community or within that game environment. And I think like through the efforts that the IAB is doing now around like education and evangelism mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and helping them identify where they find that natural community, I think we'll start to see a lot more brands and agencies start to lean into the space once they feel comfortable with that. Yeah. Uh, we're short on time, so I wish we had more because we yeah. could do this forever, right? But hit us, you know, why and how should brands get in? Yeah, it's a great question, right? 
And I would say that to your point earlier, and I know I know we're quick on time, but what I would say I'm is- I'm sure they'll give us 30 seconds. Yeah, I, uh, <laughs> as a gamer myself, I play often. If you want to find me, I'm Orange Frames. You can find me on, on the gaming <laughs> thing today. Um, but what I would say is that like, I play Call of Duty with my friends frequently, right? And uh, during our missions, one of the things that we're supposed to do is we're supposed to loot grocery stores and loot um, like liquor stores and things like that and find pieces and bring them back out of the game, right? Why I highlight that is to say, Brands today should find their authentic place inside games, but there are many games and many opportunities for you to find that natural fit. As I run through a grocery store, I'm picking up Band-Aids, right? Like, how easy is that for a brand to... What I think is awesome yeah. is that you're up here, this is a high-value guy, right? This guy works at the trade desk, has four kids, runs his household, right? And he's talking about how he's playing Call of Duty, looting, you know, uh, <laughs> grocery stores, right? Yeah. Like, and people are like, oh my God, I'll never want to advertise in that environment, it's so unbrand safe. Yeah. Like, this is the guy you're missing. Yeah, that's the you only know, time you're probably you going to find advertise me. In that <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know about high value, but mid value. Let's call it mid value. Uh, but, but the point here being is that, like, when I play these games, I expect to see natural ad placements in those games. That's not happening today. I get inside there, I see generic billboards, and I'm like, oh, that's, that stands out to me as weird. I would expect as I'm running through the grocery store to easily see a CPG brand posted on the wall because that feels real to me, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think there are lots of places for entry for these brands to have a natural organic fit inside the gaming environment. Yeah, I yeah. agree, I agree. I wish we had more time. I hope you guys appreciated that. Uh, thank you very much for your time, and we'll uh, head off stage right